All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second installment of our expert speaker series with Dr. Laura Hamill here. Uh, welcome back if you were able to make it to our first installment in March around engagement and well-being. But today we will be talking about a topic that I know is very near and dear to Dr. Hamill's heart and our entire Limeade Institute, uh, employee burnout. So we will go ahead and get started right away. I know we only have 30 minutes. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So we are going to do some brief introductions, talk about the topic of burnout overall, what it is and how it relates to employee engagement, and then break it down with some real world scenarios as well. Then at the end, we will have some open time for questions and answers. So we'd love for this to be participatory at the end as well. So please feel free to write any questions that you might have in the chat box and we will try and answer them all. But allow me to introduce uh, Dr. Laura Hamill, who hates when I call her Dr. <laughs> Hamill, so we'll call her Laura for today. Um, we are incredibly lucky to have Laura as our chief people officer, our chief science officer, um, and she is one of the founders of Limeade, has a PhD in organizational psychology, and is also an incredibly kind human being. Aww. So, hello, Laura. Hi, Nick. Hi, Nick. Thanks You're so much. excited very, for today? Very much, very much. Fantastic. So Laura, let's start by uh, just getting on the same page here. And with everything we talk about, everything we do, it's all related to employee engagement. Yes. So I was wondering if you could maybe just give us a quick definition of what employee engagement is and why we're so concerned with it. Yeah, absolutely. So employee engagement is this deep connection and sense of purpose you can have at work that results in extra energy and extra commitment. Um, what's really neat about this is it feels good to be engaged. You probably know that feeling of being all in, being excited to come to work. It feels really good to be engaged. It's also excellent for the employer when your employees are engaged. Um, engaged workforces lead to higher levels of customer satisfaction, higher levels of profit, increased employee uh, retention, decreased safety incidents. Really, any result that an organization might care about it's better if you have an engaged workforce. So it just is really good um, uh, to focus on employee engagement. And really, I think one thing that's really important about this is that any job can be, um, you can be engaged with. So it's not just certain kinds of jobs, high tech sure. jobs or anything like that. It can be any job where an employee can feel that deep connection and sense of purpose. Fantastic. So it sounds like obviously there's a lot that goes in employee engagement and a lot that can come but wanted to introduce this concept of burnout. So what burnout is, how it's related to employee engagement? Absolutely. I, first of all, I've been fascinated by this topic, I think for a couple of reasons. One of them is I personally felt burnt, burned out in my life. Um, so I know that field. It's also one of those topics where there's been a lot of academic research, but it hasn't been practice in a lot of organizations. Most organizations really um, dealt with burnout in systematic ways. So, Click on it. Looks like we're in something difficult, difficult. Thank you everybody for your patience. Well, I keep going. Yeah, that'd be great. Sorry guys, we're just I'm not but we're going to keep talking anyway. So one of the things that I think is really interesting about this idea of um, burnout is the concept. Okay. Sorry. All right, here we go. Finally. All right. So this idea that you have on fire in order to burn out. That is, you have to care, you have to be all in, even to start the burnout. So I think that's a really important thing of this idea of burnout, right? You, you can't just think about anybody who's going to burn out. It's gotta, it starts with those people who are the most committed to your organization. And this idea when you have high levels of employee engagement, so I call it hyper-engagement. So high levels of employee engagement for long periods of time, when that is intersected with low levels, and you're really not feeling good or feeling a sense of purpose. So there has to be some way that either you organization you work at intervenes if if you had engagement and low level of, of well of well being. Mm -hmm. That when burnout starts to happen. Interesting. To topic of burnout from a little bit more of an so it's a really interesting thing that's been studied a lot. Positions and and again we're thinking about 
pretty this idea of being highly engaged. So long periods of time, you have all these stressors coming at you break. So what's interesting is um, there's a cycle of things that happen. First thing that happens is you start to feel exhausted. Mm -hmm. And this is the kind of exhaustion that's not cured by eight hours of sleep. It's that I just complete depletion. I'm so tired. I just can't really start to feel like I have energy anymore. So really low levels of energy. So that's the first sign of burnout. But the next thing that's really interesting is that people who are on this kind of cycle then become cynical. And so it's this idea of feeling like, um, I'm fed up. I just don't care anymore. This is when people might um, like objectify, objectify their customers or their coworkers or the company overall. Um, and then the last stage is this idea of what we call inefficacy, hmm. just not feeling like you're making a difference anymore. And so what is really sad to me about this topic is it started out as those people who cared so much that they really would sacrifice everything. They'd give all their time, their effort, their energy to this organization, to the work that they were doing. But then it goes into this natural cycle of cynicism and inefficacy. They start to become people you kind of think of as negative. It's, it's kind of easy to write them off because they're so negative. But again, they started out as your most committed employees. So what's really the difference? One of the things that I see happening a lot is that people confuse this term, this topic of disengagement with burnout. So I thought it might be useful to just clarify the difference. So again, this concept of burnout is caring so deeply for so long with a, without a break from the stress that you feel depleted and cynical. It's this idea, I've just given everything to this job. Mm -hmm. Now what's different from disengagement is disengagement is really, I, I don't care. Right? I'm past the point of caring, or I've never cared at all. This is just a job. I just go here, and I, I, I so I get a paycheck, right? Because mm -hmm. I have to work somewhere. Um, what's, what can happen with burnout is if you are on this path of just feeling so depleted and cynical, you actually can become disengaged. Mm -hmm. You Probably a way to cope with that situation is to stop caring. Um, but it's not, being disengaged is not the same as being burnt out. So disengagement's really about this lack of caring. Now, what we also like to couple that with is we want to strive for engagement, right? So engagement's more of this being energized and connected to your job um, so much that you start to feel a sense of purpose, right? You deeply connect with your work. And so I like to think about it like this is way more than just a job. So why do we care about this topic of burnout? So first of all, we know that burnout leads to some negative things for individual people. So when you're burned out, it's really hard to be productive. You don't have any energy, right? But there also are a lot of stress-related health issues that can come up. Um, increased substance abuse. It can result in starting to feel anxious, depressed, lower self-esteem. Um, and what I think is so interesting, again, about this topic is it shows up differently for every single person. So for me, I might gain 40 pounds. For the next person, they might become an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. Another person might be going through a divorce. It shows up differently in every single person. Again, another reason why it's easy to kind of paint people in the corner or write mm -hmm. them off when they're burned out because it doesn't show up the same way for every person. Too easy to, not too easy to identify. Right, right, exactly. It can look like a personal problem, right? Now, what happens for organizations, when you have burned out employees in organizations, the, your employees aren't as committed, they tend to be more absent, and they're definitely more likely to leave the organization. So really negative consequences for an individual person and for organizations. But it also can be contagious. And I think this is a really interesting concept. When there's somebody at work who's burned out, there really can be a lot more conflict around that person. Remember, they're cynical, they're not feeling like they're not making a difference. Mm -hmm. So there's conflict around that person, a lot more disruption at work. And then also it spills over, of course it does, right? It spills over into life outside of work. So burnout really has big kind of ripple effects for people around um, that person, for that person themselves, of course, and for the organization. So one of the things, again, that I think is so important um, is that most companies think of burnout as a personal issue when it's really an organizational one. Again, the two reasons why we think it's a personal issue is because of that natural cycle, right, of becoming cynical and starting to feel like you're not making a difference, combined with 
showing up differently for every single person, right? Again, it could, could be divorce or substance abuse. It's just it's different for each person. So it's really easy to think about burnout as, hey, that's not our fault as an organization. That's that person's fault. They just are having a really hard time in life. Um, but if what I think is um, kind of fascinating, if you actually look at the research, burnout is primarily caused by the organization. So the primary causes of burnout are these things that are listed here on the right. Things like, of course, overload, right? Workload, time pressure. But some other things that I think are really interesting on this list, this concept of not being supported by your manager, not getting feedback, not, being, not participating in decisions, but also things that are really related to trust. So this idea of not feeling like things are, are equitable or that there's equity, uh, feeling like there's a disconnect between my personal values and what the organization is showing us that they value. And then this idea of a broken psychological contract. So what, what I've decided I'm going to give to this organization versus what I get back when there's a breakdown between those things. So again, this, this concept is um, really important to understand that organizations are the primary causes of burnout but we see it primarily as a personal issue. That is interesting. Yeah, and I think you know one of the reasons that this is such a fascinating topic for, for me and for us internally is we're so focused on employee engagement and driving engagement and focusing on the disengaged employees, but burnout is really something that affects those employees who are already engaged. Yeah. And you know, no better example I think of than here internally at Limeade actually, where we are lucky enough and very intentional to have a workforce filled with amazing people with a lot of potential, very high achievers, self-starters, but there's also a lot of risk for burnout here internally. Absolutely. And there's a high level of stress as well. So, I, you know, I really want to give this kind of a real world example here. Yeah. And let's take Limeade for example. Yeah. So what can we do in this first scenario to combat burnout with high level or when there are high levels of stress? Yeah, absolutely. How are those two related? I know it's one of those things that, of course, we want people to be engaged but it's so important that we're really paying attention to it and, and, and really understanding that there's no way you could expect 100% engagement every single day of the year, sure. year after year, right? Sure. If you really want to keep your employees, if you really want to keep those amazing people who want to be engaged, you've got to think about recovery. You've got to think about their well-being. So that's so important. One of the things that we were really interested in is this concept of stress and how it's related to employee engagement. So this is a real quick um, kind of overview of a study we did in Limeade Institute. Limeade Institute is one of the groups that um, I'm responsible for, and we do research on the topic of well-being and employee engagement. And we did this study, um, somebody on my team did this last year, and it was so interesting. So basically, we, we segmented the, the group into three groups in terms of their levels of employee engagement. So we have a high engagement, moderate, medium, and low engagement. What we were really interested in, when those people who report high levels of employee engagement, when you look at them, what do they report in terms of stress? Mm -hmm. So we were really surprised to see that, that the majority of those people reported low levels of stress. Now that, was, that kind of blew my mind, right? Because mm -hmm. I think about people who I know who are highly engaged at work, they don't look like low levels of stress, right? right. They look like those people who've got things to do, they're running to meetings, they got lists going, they got tons of people mm -hmm. they're talking to. There's a lot of energy around them. And you could, I would assume that they would report higher levels of stress or at least moderate levels of stress. I was really surprised to see that they report the lowest levels of stress. Mm -hmm. So I was really interested in that. So we were digging into that and thinking, What's going on with those people? So what if maybe those people with high levels of engagement and low stress, maybe they don't think about their work as stressful. So even though they look like they've got a lot of activity around them, a lot of energy around them, maybe they have a different way of framing that, right? Maybe they think about it in terms of, ooh, I can't wait to dig into that, or ooh, I get to go talk to people about this thing, or I get to, you know, I have this challenge. It's exciting to me that I get to dig in. While other people who maybe aren't engaged might think about it like, oh, I got to go deal with all these problems or I have to go to work today, mm -hmm. right? Maybe there's a way that people who are engaged think about stress. So that's one explanation. Another one could be that they just feel more supported by their organization. They're working in places where a lot of those stressful, those stressors are maybe reduced and so they feel more support. Either way, I think there's something really interesting going on there between high levels of engagement and low stress. 
But the next thing we did was look at this, this other group that I didn't really talk about before. What about those people who are reporting high levels of engagement but high stress? Maybe those people are the ones we should be looking at as at kind of an, on the early track for burnout. No longer is it feeling sure. positive and I get to and I sure. can't wait to and I want to, right? Now it's starting to feel more negative. So those people, getting to those people early um, is what we're trying to do in terms of understanding the early signs of burnout. Mm -hmm. That's great. So one last thing I'd like to just point out here in this, in this section is the role of the manager. So managers are so important to this whole equation. They're the ones who are the closest to the employee. They're the ones who can recognize when somebody's been on this you know, mm -hmm. hyper engagement trajectory, when they've been working really, really hard and all in for long periods of time. Managers play such an important role identifying you know, and knowing that maybe it's time for recovery or maybe it's time to rethink kind of the work that they're doing. So managers are critical. They really are. We think of them as like the glue or the connection point in the organization. They're how the employee connects to the company and how the company connects to the employee. Mm -hmm. Managers are that pivot point, that glue. They're so important. Um, so also on top of that, they're critical for employee engagement. Gallup does some really cool research to show that managers I, are really a, the primary driver of employee engagement for the people on their team. So we know managers matter a lot. That's great. It's a really interesting relationship between those levels of engagement and stress within an organization. Uh, one thing we hear a lot of the times from our customers or companies we talk to out in the field is the difficulties in engaging different demographics within their population. Uh, and especially, you know, I think of uh, the millennial population yeah. and how there is this focus on value and purpose within work. And it would seem to me as if they're uh, a population that is at risk for burnout as well. So can you talk a little bit about you know, how we might engage the millennial population or prevent the risk of burnout? Yeah, absolutely. I feel like millennials get such a bad rap. I mean, to me, <laughs> right? Like, there's so much finger wagging from us old people around. You know, how dare you ask for these kinds of things? You know, this, this idea of sense of entitlement. When, Really, all along, we should have been asking for some of the same things, to be honest, right? Like feedback, professional growth, meaning and purpose. It's all sure. things that we should expect from our workplace, I believe. Um, so millennials really have um, kind of, a, to me, they're ahead of, ahead of things. And what I think is interesting is that they're going to be forcing us to work harder and harder and creating places to work where we really are supporting employee engagement, right? Mm -hmm. And what I see happening, what I see organizations doing is they don't focus as much around creating those conditions for engagement. They kind of focus in other ways. So one of the things I see them see a lot of organizations doing is they hire for engagement, right? Mm -hmm. So they're looking for those people who have passion. I've always teased that there was uh, one company that I was working for that when I got hired, I asked them, why did you hire me? Mm -hmm. And they said, well, it's because you had a twinkle in your eye. <laughs> and I'm assuming that twinkle was a proxy for passion or or enthusiasm or excitement. Um, and so what I see organizations do is they hire those people and the people come to work and it's a letdown, right? It, they don't feel like the organization is really supporting their engagement. Um, and I also see organizations talking about employee engagement mostly from the perspective of what can these employees do for me, right? Sometimes I see organizations even defining employee engage, engagement as discretionary effort or going above and beyond thinking about only from the, the good things that happen for the organization if we have engaged employees. What I want to see is let's talk about all the things organizations should be doing mm -hmm. to create those conditions for engagement. So that was, um, we did some work in Limeade Institute around this, around looking at the statistical drivers of employee engagement. And so these are basically kind of trying to reframe the, the survey items into terms that make it clear like what needs to happen in the organization. So we need to create situations where people like to work, where mm -hmm. it's energizing, they feel challenged, they know they're making a difference, they have purpose, where they really feel valued and included and treated fairly. Sure. That they can use, you know, not only do they get challenged, but they can use their strengths. They can do the things that they're really good at too. It can't just always be that they're challenged. Um, and then some of the things on the right, they're really about, you know, this, this kind of sweet spot of stress. You know, I want to be able to focus. I want to do great work, but I don't want to be bored. Mm -hmm. And I also don't want to be burned out, right? I don't want to be over the top. I, I also want to have a life outside of work. And then kind of finally, this organization, I want to work somewhere 
where the people around me, my manager, my team, and the organizational overall, they care about me. They really authentically care about me. So if you look at this list, I'm hoping you could see that there are some things here that are absolutely about you know, this kind of idea of connecting to my work and having kind of a sense of purpose at work, but there's some things here that are also related to well-being. Um, you know, the, the things that are related to stress, the kind of idea of having purpose. Those are all concepts that are really well-being concepts. So well-being and employee engagement really go hand in hand. Well, as a, as a millennial myself, I'll say <laughs> thank you for our whole generation. Okay. One point there. Um, but last scenario here, you know, obviously we talked about a lot of information, a lot of the effects of burnout. So really simple, how do we prevent it? How yeah. can we as individuals, as managers, as organizations prevent burnout? Yeah, that's really, really a good question. Um, so again, back to this idea of well-being and employee engagement being so related related to each other and that both are really important. How would you ever expect like an employee to come to work and give their all, right? Give all their discretionary effort mm -hmm. if they didn't feel like you cared about them as a person, mm -hmm. right? Or how would we um, really expect them to do that if they were stressed or they didn't feel physically feel good or they had low energy? We can't, it, it's just not possible, mm -hmm. right? To expect people to have that sustained, long-term hyper-engagement without acknowledging and caring about them as people. So really our focus in this, in this arena of burnout is on well-being and employee engagement, right? So making sure we're focusing on both of those. So if you think about it from the perspective of a manager, so those of you who are managers that are out there, and you think about how you might pre prevent burnout in your employees, think about this idea of recovery time. Um, you know when your employees have big projects, big deliverables. Sure. What if you actually proactively said, you know what, that afternoon after you have that big presentation, why don't you go do something that feels good that where you can recover? Maybe mm -hmm. if you go work outside or maybe you take the rest of the day off. Um, maybe you work on something different than what you've been working on. But really acknowledging that you have to have some recovery time. Now, I also would put a little caveat in there that it's not enough. Because remember those causes or organizational causes. So having recovery doesn't make everything better when you come back from that recovery time. So it's still, it's not, it's not the, the only thing that needs to happen, but recovery time is a great thing to do. Also, um, meaningful check-ins. And meaningful is the key word here. It's not just about asking, okay, so what happened with that project, Nick? How's that project going? Or what happened with that sales finalist meeting? It's about actually talking to people like human beings and asking how are they doing and so how you can help, right? Mm -hmm. And doing it authentically, of course. And then this last part, this care about them as people is absolutely related. It's, it's almost silly to put it as a little sub bullet point, right? <laughs> to even think that you could ever check that off or that it's a simple task. It's, it has to be authentic. But I think managers sometimes forget, again, that their, their role is to be an advocate for that employee and to really be that connection point between the employee and the organization, to be that glue. And the more that managers can really think about, you know, am I creating a situation on my team where my employees can be engaged? Have I done some of those, you know, if I, if I looked at those conditions for engagement, am I really trying to support these different aspects of engagement? Um, and really, you know, realizing that it's hard work, but it's absolutely doable to create a place where people have both well-being and employee engagement. Now, if you're an individual, um, I, who's going through this burnout, there's also lots of things to think about. Again, we talked about this idea of recovery and kind of giving that to yourself. I mean, sometimes I, I'm trying to do that, right? Like after I have right. a big presentation, actually carving out time to mm -hmm. like take a deep breath because I'm really not any good to anybody anyway <laughs> <laughs> right after. Um, also this idea of energy. We didn't talk a ton about it, but energy is really what's behind this employee engagement piece. It's also really a big part of well-being. So can you find that work? Find those projects, find those things that are the things that give you that energy, that make you feel excited, that make you want to come to work every day. And I also we throw in the people, you know, the people around you who do that too, um, versus people who kind of pull it, drain you of energy. Uh, a couple other things around well-being mindset, and this is a whole other conversation that we could talk on and on about, but there are real things that you can do every day that really can help you prevent um, burnout. There's kind of a, a frame of mind that is related to resilience and positivity and self-efficacy or, or believing in yourself. Again, that idea of how we frame things. You know, do we start our day every day thinking, 
you know, I get to do this. I am so grateful for having this opportunity to go and be with these people versus having, you know, a more negative way of starting your day. Um, and then this idea of purpose is so critical. It's critical to well-being. It's critical to employee engagement. And I really encourage people to be clear about what is your purpose, you know, and it, it can be anything. It just has to matter to you. Um, and, you know, think about in your job, are you connecting to that purpose on a regular basis or not? A social connection is so important and having a little fun and having, you know, connecting with people as human beings. And then this idea of organizational support, and maybe I'll just kind of end with that. Um, organizational support is so important. This is just a super, it's just a pretty simple model. It's based on existing um, academic research that's called perceived organizational support. It's just a really easy way of thinking about what does the organization need to do hmm. to authentically support well-being. And so there's some stuff on the right, we call it local support. And you think about it just like the people who are around you. Um, what are those people, what is your manager, um, how does your manager just talk to you about your well-being? Do, do you get the sense that your manager cares about you as a person? Those people, the, your team that's around you, maybe other social networks, how conducive is the physical work environment for your well-being? Um, so those things really matter at the local level. And then at the organization level, you know, are there real tangible tools and programs that you can point to? Um, has there been some sort of indication that, you know, caring about your well-being is important for our business success? Do leaders act like role models? Are they reinforcing? And then finally, the culture. The culture of the organization really should be a circle around all of this. The culture can work toward kind of supporting well-being and engagement or can work against it. So how do we really dig in and, and start working on making sure our culture is supportive? Um, and just so like think about the concept of trust as a cultural attribute. How does trust really, um, does it work in this organization? Does, does, does the organization trust its employees? Do the employees trust the organization that they're going to do the right thing for them? So organizational support is a really important component of this whole thing. Yeah, so as always, I uh, learn a ton from the research you and the Institute are doing, and there's just so much rich application for our customers and for organizations in general. Uh, can you just summarize uh, some, some yeah. key takeaways from today? Absolutely. So one of them is, I hope you get this idea that employee engagement is this deep connection and sense of purpose. It's got this component of energy, this feeling of enthusiasm mm -hmm. and excitement for your work that really also can translate into commitment, commitment to the organization. Um, and then burnout is when you've had those high levels of, of employee engagement for long periods of time and you have low well-being. It's where those two ideas come together and you don't, you know, you're not intervening or the organization hasn't really intervened. Um, takeaway three I'd say is most companies think of burnout as a personal issue and there's reasons why we do it. It's the way it shows up and the kind of natural cycle of it, but really the causes are organizational in nature. Critical. Yeah. And then um, I really encourage organizations to focus both on well-being and employee engagement to reduce mm -hmm. burnout. I love what you had said before that uh, you have to be on fire in order to burn out, right? Yeah, completely. But Laura, thank you so much. Uh, I think we have a couple questions on the line here, yeah. so feel free to keep the questions coming. Uh, first and foremost, Laura, do you have any tips for senior leaders who are experiencing burnout? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Might be near I, I know. Burnout. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So I think it's, you know, I think it's so important for senior leaders to be role models for this topic. I think it's obvious to everybody when a leader is at the risk for burnout, right? Sure. You can see them, you know, following that arc, following that, you know, getting cynical, getting feeling like they're not making a difference. So I think the more that leaders can actually take a step back create that time for themselves to act, to do that recovery. Mm -hmm. And then think about, to me, that, that energy, where you get energy from. It's a lot of the individual pieces that I was recommending before absolutely reply, apply here in this situation. So what is it that you could be working on every day that maybe creates more energy versus takes away your energy? Of course, we all have to do things in our jobs that maybe don't always feel energizing, but can we make sure that more of what we're doing is the stuff that creates energy? So that's what I would, I would recommend, probably the same for any individual person, but I would just caveat that, that leaders just really need to understand the impact that they can have on others when they're burnt out, the stage that they set. And if you think about how managers are sort of the constraint or cap, for anything that happens in the organization. Um, so they're going to really set the stage for the whole rest of the organization in terms of how they handle it and whether or not they allow that to continue. Mm -hmm. 
So does a person need to start at <laughs> exhaustion before experiencing cynicism yeah. and inefficacy? Is it a true progression? In yeah. That? Well, this is something that, again, the, there's a lot of really great research on <laughs> this. And there, it, it does seem for most people, it is, does follow that path or that cycle of starting with exhaustion first. I think the exhaustion piece is what leads to the cynicism and the inefficacy because you just don't have anything else mm -hmm. in you. you. There are no more resources left to be able to feel positive about things, to feel like you're making a difference. So the exhaustion is kind of what causes that. It's this idea of you only have so many resources to give and when, you, when they're gone, they're gone. They're depleted if you're not building those back up again. So I think we might have time for just one more question here, another great one. How do we encourage a company buy-in to this idea when it is not currently, yeah. not currently bought in? Right. Um, what's in, I think what's good about what's happening to me in most organizations mm -hmm. is that we bought into this concept of employee engagement. So I think if you start with employee engagement and, and really kind of emphasize your efforts there, and then start talking about burnout as kind of a special case of employee engagement. It's this idea that don't we want to keep these employees that are so awesome and so engaged? Oh, wow, look, we might think about this idea of burnout because these are the people who have been, you know, really committed to our organization, maybe some of the most talented ones, the ones we want to keep. Let's then look at burnout. So I, I would start with employee engagement, and, you know, there's so much research around connecting employee engagement to business results. So if your organization already doesn't care about employee engagement, that's where I'd go. Um, but then let's talk about how that high levels of engagement intersect with low levels of well-being and, and focus there. Dr. Laura Hamill, thank you so much. Uh, as always, this is fantastic information to everyone on the webinar. Thank you for attending. Hopefully you got some, uh, some great thoughts here and some applications for your own roles. Uh, be on the lookout for the slides as well as the recording uh, and for our next installment in our expert speaker series with Dr. Laura Hamill. Awesome. Thank you thank so you much, Thank you very Nick. much. That was fun. Have a great rest of your day.